last session, uh, during this last session, we are going to uh, discuss uh, inflation and uh, relative prices and inflation. The art of and science of patience, which is normally uh, the task of uh, all researchers, and, uh, but especially those uh, that uh, study uh, inflation and uh, uh, transmission of monetary policy to, uh, to prices. Uh, so we are very happy to have the four co-authors, if I understand well. Veronica, are you online? Yes, I am. Can you see me? Um, we cannot see you, but we can hear you very well, so uh, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Ah, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Hello, Veronica. Hi. Uh, so this is the uh, Geneva report of uh, this year, uh, and uh, we are very happy to have uh, this presentation here in Paris uh, during this symposium. So thank you for to, uh, to the four of you. And I, I understand that uh, you're going to present the report at four voices uh, in a row, 10 minutes each, and then we have uh, a discussion with the audience. So we, we start with Sylvana. Thank you very much. Um, so let's start by refreshing our memories uh, on the debate on inflation. There were two views on the table when inflation uh, surged. Uh, the first view was that inflation was temporary and monetary policy should fully look through. And the second view was that inflation was driven by demand and was going to be very persistent, so we needed a, an aggressive monetary policy response to contain that persistence and any potential de-anchoring of expectations. The Geneva report back in the spring put forward a third view. Um, temporary supply shocks generate lagged responses in core inflation as the shocks transmit through the input-output uh, structure of the economy through those linkages. These indirect effects, which are not quite second round effects, uh, can take some time and can be more persistent in a setting with uh, staggered price adjustments. But eventually the supply-driven transmission will phase away as does the shock. The main transmission uh, uh, mechanism here of, of these shocks happened through the goods market rather than the labor market or inflation expectations. The report highlighted in that context the, the risks and uh, costs of an aggressive monetary policy response and advocated for patience. Uh, this conclusion and the analysis was particularly relevant for the euro area where the shock affected negatively the terms of trade um, and this was somewhat different from the US where demand played a bigger role as a driver of inflation, uh, in part because of the fiscal uh, impulse, but also because the war in Ukraine uh, boosted the terms of trade of the US as a net exporter of energy and other commodities. Um, our view was uh, and is that given the much larger hit to supply in the euro area, and the fact that the shock takes take some time to unwind, uh, but does unwind eventually, patience was needed in the conduct of monetary policy. Particularly as monetary policy affects the economy with a consider considerable lag. No, we normally think about the peak impact of uh, monetary policy changes taking place a, at least a year after the monetary policy intervention. So they cannot face value, this would mean that the tightening that done early this year will have peak impact in 2024 and beyond. Um, so the report starts off with, uh, with four uh, key facts. Um, first, the surge in inflation can be attributed in large part to the supply shocks caused by the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. We highlighted the extraordinary increase in, in uh, the prices of energy and other commodities. Uh, for many countries, the increase in energy prices alone was comparable or even larger than what they experienced in the 1970s. Second, this led to large changes in relative prices as the changes in, um, in energy prices transmitted through the economy uh, via those uh, input-output linkages. All sectors use energy either directly or indirectly. Um, this transmission of shocks doesn't happen immediately uh, and as it take, takes time uh, for, the, for those shocks uh, to, um, to travel through the system. But the important thing is that these waves of sectoral inflation 
eventually peter out. Um, the third fact was that there were important differences between the US and Europe. As I said, Europe as an importer of energy and other com commodities suffered a very large adverse uh, terms of trade shock, where for the US, uh, this was a, a positive boost to its terms of trade. And second, the other difference was uh, the big fiscal impulse in, in the US. Um, and finally, the four, um, um, the four point to emphasize is that these differences in terms of trade and fiscal, in, in fiscal stimulus uh, did matter for the patterns of demand. Uh, we saw con a much weaker consumption in uh, Europe than in, in the US and as well as uh, other uh, components of, of demand. Uh, so let me walk you through uh, those facts. Um, this uh, chart here uh, illustrates uh, uh, the first point on, on energy, the increase in gas prices in Europe was comparable or larger than increases in oil prices uh, back in the 70s. Energy was not the only story. The pandemic caused imbalances uh, and supply shortages, uh, which get ref what reflected in, in uh, all global indices of uh, supply chain pressures like this one here. Um, this led to huge changes in relative prices. Um, and a big theme of, of the report is precisely on this, uh, on this point. Uh, as uh, this is illustrated in, in this graph, we can see the big uh, spike with the pandemic zoomed in in the graph on your, on your chart, on, on your uh, right. Um, this effectively led to the big fall uh, in terms of trade, uh, in terms of uh, trade for the, for, for the euro area and, and the big boost uh, for the US. And this had a material impact on the economy. We can see here consumption in the US recovered very quickly and in, indeed got back to, um, to the pre-COVID trend by the middle of uh, 2021, overtaking that trend. Whereas uh, in the Euro area, we see a big gap, um, uh, big persistent gap in consumption vis-a-vis -vis the pre-COVID trend. Uh, we observe even bigger gaps for uh, investment and similar um, um, gaps for um, GDP. Uh, so monetary uh, policy tightened uh, aggressively both in the US and uh, in the Euro area. And uh, we can see this um, in, in this chart with the uh, changes in policy rate. Uh, I guess part, part of the puzzle here is uh, given the differences in the nature of the shock, uh, why the responses were so similar in, across these jurisdictions. Um, uh, finally, uh, as Veronica, Lucrecia, Michaela will stress, what we've seen in the behavior of core and headline is very consistent with, with what we have in the model in the report and also consistent with the, the historical evidence. Uh, core inflation has been stickier following headline inflation uh, and um, we see that pattern both in inflation and disinflation, disinflation phases. Um, this is inflation has been uh, faster than uh, what we saw in other episodes. Um, and uh, just compare with the Volcker's disinflation, uh, at, at the time inflation was kept between three and a half and 4% uh, for 10 years. Uh, perhaps because they, have diff they, they didn't have the inflation targeting framework uh, as we have now in place. Um, so six months on for the report, uh, where are we now? Uh, the supply shock is unwinding, which is pushing uh, down on inflation and supporting activity. Um, this, uh, this is a reverse of what we saw back in 2022. Uh, but on the demand side, and this is a different uh, part, monetary policy has started to bite, and monetary policy is pushing down both on inflation and on activity. And then what happens to activity in the end is, is the result of this tug of war be between demand and supply forces that so far for Europe has, been, uh, has resulted in stagnation. Um, now, what we can be confident is that both forces, supply and demand, are pushing inflation in the same direction uh, downwards. Um, so um, 
before I pause, and so in, in light of all of this, we think the message of higher for longer, we need to morph into not so high and not for much longer. So I'll, I'll pause here. Thank you very much, Silvana. So we now have uh, Michaela Marcusen. So basically, if we, if we think about um, the, the debate that Silvana just framed for us, one of the things that we were, have been keeping a close eye on here is, of course, what's been going on with inflation expectations. Because if we'd seen inflation expectations uh, shooting up in some uncontrolled way, uh, or suddenly wage price spirals emerging in, in a dramatic way, that would probably have been uh, disproving uh, our, our, our theses. But this is indeed not the case. And when we look at inflation expectations, they have been incredibly well behaved. Here I'm just so showing a selection of measures. Uh, on the first chart over here with the red and the green line, it's uh, various market-derived expectations. Now, of course, when we're looking at market expectations, we do have to be careful because it's both an expectation and a risk premium on that expectation. So just a point to keep in mind. Then we also look uh, over here at some other measures. Uh, we are looking at the purple line which is the University of Michigan expected change in inflation. We're looking at the, the medium term ones here. So uh, five to 10 years, they jump around, but in the large scheme of things, we haven't seen any kind of significant acceleration here. And then we look at the consensus of economists, which of course has to be the most reliable one, right? As we're a bunch of economists in the room. And you can see that one has been the most stable. So I don't know if that's a reflection of the great confidence that we have in central banks, or if it's a reflection of the confidence that we have in the inflation regime that we think we are in today. If we then think about um, you know, taking a, a bit more of a critical view of all of this, what we did in the report was we looked at uh, a potential anchoring of inflation expectations and tried to test this idea. So we basically uh, drew on some work which has been done by the CBO and how they think about inflation expectations. And as you can see from the equa equation here, they think about inflation expectations as being a function of past inflation and a function of the central bank target. Now, if people were just 100% confident in the central bank, our lambda here would be at one because it would be perfect anchoring of the central bank inflation expectation announcements. And of course, if there was no credibility in the central bank whatsoever, it would be at zero. So let's take a look and you can see different variations of this that we've done in the report. And what we see here is basically, it's very hard to argue today that there's some kind of unanchoring of inflation expectations. If we look uh, at, at the first one here, so we took the, the Cleveland Fed uh, expected inflation, and what we can see is we get movement around the COVID crisis, the energy price shocks, but it's really no different from the types of movements that we saw around the great financial crisis. So there's nothing really to suggest to us today that there's some kind of unanchoring. If we look at the consensus, it's even more stable today than it was during the great financial crisis. So again, the economists seem uh, particularly confident here. Now, of course, the ideal would have been that we could have gone all the way back to the 1970s. Unfortunately, the, the data available does not allow us to do that. But we did stretch back and have a look at what the, the, the Cleveland uh, Fed's five-year, five-year uh, expectations do. Now, one of the issues we have, of course, is that it's not that long ago that we actually know that the Fed has a 2% inflation target. And we basically set the target uh, historically from 82 to 96 to around 4%, which was probably the market perception at the time. Um, and when we, when we look at what's been going on historically, we do get a sense that in the period uh, before the millennium, Perhaps things were not that perfectly anchored, although it wasn't that bad either, but get a sense that maybe it wasn't that perfectly anchored in, 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 in part of this period. But when we look to the post-global financial crisis, again, things appear relatively well anchored. So when we look at the evidence on inflation expectations, we don't really find much to suggest some kind of structural unanchoring here, 
And likewise, when we look at the labor markets, we don't see evidence today of a dramatic wage price spiral running away. Um, as I always tell my boss, and uh, I advise you tell your bosses the same, it's important that wages go up here because we do need to make sure wages are part of the adjustment process. We don't want wage growth to be flat. That would be quite catastrophic for the adjustment of the economy. So a relative adjustment on wages is part of this process. What we don't want is runaway wages, but we don't want to have no wage growth either. And just looking at the split between profits and wages today in gross value added, we're actually in a situation where wages have been losing out recently, so it would be normal to have an adjustment on this front. Now, I wanted just to show you the short-term inflation expectations. So here we're looking at the one-year outlook from Michigan, so we're looking at the consumers, and then we're looking at PCE inflation year on year and core PCE. And what's quite remarkable here is uh, I went as far back as I, I can go, and you can see that uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, we did have much higher inflation expectations. And what you see when you look historically across the chart is there are periods where we move around and jump around. And of course, when you suddenly have an inflation shock, it's normal that consumer inflation expectations would adjust to that. But the real question is, once the inflation shock fades out, whether those expectations then also move back down. And that's what the evidence suggests today. That's what we're seeing at the moment. Now, of course, the big excitement in the market um, is uh, when the central banks are going to cut rates or not. And um, based on, on, on what we're suggesting, based on the nature of the inflationary shock, it would seem to make sense for the central banks to at some point consider an adjustment of the monetary policy. Indeed, there is a risk if the central banks decide to remain at very at relatively high interest rate levels here, that uh, they actually end up provoking a much more adverse economic outcome uh, in response to the supply shock. So you see, this is when the slide disappears because I decided to say something on monetary policy and maybe I wasn't supposed to do that in, in these rooms, but uh, I, I took a risk here and my slide disappeared. So that's it for, from that point. But let me just finish on that point on, on the market expectations. Now, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the Fed dots, uh, which are close, closely watched in the markets. We're looking at the market expectations from last night. Some of you probably saw that payrolls came out a little bit firmer than consensus had expected. So these things moved around again. But it is quite striking that the markets are telling us now in, in no uncertain terms that at some point in a not too distant future, uh, rate cuts would be appropriate. And we see this tug of war. We've seen it before between the market view and, and the central banks. But our point is really to say that uh, there is a balance of risks here, and I thought that Isabel uh, Schnabel put it very nicely the other day. She reminded us of Keynes and what to do when the facts change. And I think in this inflation debate that we've seen, and there has been a very lively debate, I think that at least uh, what we've seen so far, the facts suggest that uh, the evidence that we present here in the Geneva report is playing out as expected. So I think the facts are working out in that direction. And uh, my monetary policy advice would be to take those facts into consideration. I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, Michaela. We will uh, take facts into consideration as usual. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, now your okay. turn. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so thank you. I think it's uh, about the 10th time I present this report. So that, uh, uh, but uh, things keep on changing. Now, to be sure, I mean, what my colleagues presented uh, um, is just a bunch of facts, okay? So there is no uh, causal or identification of uh, any, you know, causal mechanism. But what we wanted to do in this report is to look at the fact from the past and say, you know, what has happened this time, it might be different from what happened in the 70s. So maybe we are prisoner of a, of a story which is very much uh, 
linked to the secondary, the second, uh, secondary effect of inflation linked to expectation via the labor market. Is there another story that we can say that fits you know, the, the data? And uh, so now I'm going to try to, to, to present something a little bit more analytical. And um, so I will present an econometric model and then uh, Veronica will present uh, a stylized model that try to make sense of this, uh, you know, fact informed by an econometric model. So what have we done here? Um, we have uh, um, looked at the sectoral transmission of various shocks. So we have looked at two types of shocks an uneven shock, let's say oil, and, uh, and then a monetary shock, so, you know, monetary shock or, or even shock, say demand. And of course, uh, we want to do an econometric study, so we have looked at the past, okay? So this is, uh, is just suggestive of what may happen today. So we are looking at the past. And how have we done that? So we have looked at, uh, at a model which incorporates lots of information on sectoral data. So we looked at sectoral inflation, and, uh, and then we shock our model with this, uh, you know, oil shock on one hand and uh, the, the demand shock on the other hand. And, and also, we want to compare the transmission in the US uh, and in Europe, uh, because then we will have a story to tell about the differences that we will uncover. So the first exercise is on US data. And, uh, you know, technically what we are estimating is a vector autoregressive model, which is quite large, so that is regularized, so to avoid, uh, you know, overfitting, okay, which is something that, uh, you know, is not good for, for in econometric. And, uh, and uh, we know, we study the, the monetary VAR, and then, uh, we, of course, we have to identify, so we identified uh, through what we call external instruments, so is a way to, uh, to, to identify an exogenous variation, oh, and the external instruments are the FOMC announcement, okay, so this is a very traditional way in this literature to, to identify exogenous shock, and then we do, uh, we do uh, OPEC announcement shocks as, in, as, in, uh, as external instruments to look at the supply. And here we consider the 79, 2015 monthly data, there is a reason why we finished to 2015, because we do a number of technical things to take in consideration expectations of macroeconomic conditions using the Green Book, so we have to stop uh, at 2015, because the data were not available after 2015. This is just looking at the past. And uh, okay, so this is the first uh, uh, chart that I want to show you. So this is uh, the impulse response to a monetary policy shock. It is something very familiar for people who look at this kind of macro exercises. So the shock, uh, um, the shock is uh, a, a negative, uh, uh, is a negative monetary policy shock which increases the federal rate by 1%. And then you, the shaded areas that you see there are uh, percentage covered ratio of 68, 80, and 90 percentage covered ratios so of different uh, degrees of, um, you know, so of, of uncertainty. And uh, what I want to stress here is that, uh, you know, the, the, the shocks of, through the sectors uh, or have quite an homogeneous shape, okay? So this is an increase in interest rate, inflation goes down, core inflation uh, goes down, but with a delay and has a little bit more persistence. Then uh, food prices, uh, uh, you know, have the same shape, services have the same shape. So there is quite a lot of homogeneity in the transmission across sectors uh, through in response of these shocks. Now we do another exercise, uh, which is in this following chart, uh, which is an impulse, response, uh, uh, an impulse response to an oil supply shock. This time is, uh, is an, increase in the oil an increase of the WTI price by $1, okay? It's not in percentage terms. But, uh, and the, you know, the shaded areas have the same interpretation as before. Uh, the sample size uh, is the same as before. And what I want to emphasize here is that if you look at uh, the shape of these impulse response functions, what you find now is much more heterogeneity. And in particular, uh, you find, for example, that food prices, uh, you know, they react with a delay with respect to the headline inflation. And the service prices, here you have shelter, for example. You see that this has even a larger delay and quite a lot of persistence. 
Now, there are, you know, I don't know how visible these charts are, but I mean, the main point of this thing is that uh, there is much more heterogeneity in response to a supply shock than in response to a demand shock. Now, if we put everything together here, I mean, this is, uh, um, these are the, the, sh uh, the, the quantity, you cannot interpret uh, the impulse response, these are the impulse response functions putting together the two exercises. So they're not in, to be interpreted quantitatively because they are standardized, but you can see qualitatively that the shape of the monetary policy shocks across sectors is much more homogeneous than the shape uh, of the impulse response functions across sectors uh, in response to oil. So this is, uh, uh, is, the, is, is the first, uh, is the first uh, you know, set of results. The response to oil, there is a li rich lead lag structure more persistence than, uh, um, more persistence in services than in the headline. The, co -resp the response of oil inflation uh, or core inflation lag the response of headline, and uh, you know there is much more heterogeneity in response to oil. Now the second set of exercises let's now compare the U.S. and the euro area. In the euro area, historically, how have these things uh, differed? Here we're using another different sample, and the different sample is because of uh, you know, data constraints on the euro area. But you know, it's a different question, okay? So what is the, the question is, what is the difference in the transmission mechanism? So um, same identification, same, same techniques. Uh, here, uh, this is a response to an, an exogenous shock in the euro area. And uh, uh, you know, I want you to look at this because I mean, this is on historical data, but it, res you know, it kind of is very much suggestive uh, of what we have seen uh, in response to the very recent shocks. So this is the spoiled oil uh, price. This is inflation rate, which uh, reacts with some delay, but, uh, and this is core inflation, which actually re uh, reacts with quite a long lag and is quite persistent, quite a lot more persistent uh, than what we have seen actually in, uh, in, the, in the US. And in fact, if you just compare now the, the core inflation response in the Euro area and the US, uh, you see this different pattern. Now we uh, link this different pattern of persistence to the fact that it's well documented that price rigidity in the Euro area is much uh, higher than price rigidity in the US. And when we, the Veronica will present the model, this uh, kind of co combination of the heterogeneity of the transmission mechanism across sectors combined with price rigidity is what creates the persistence and the lag effect of the response of core inflation. Oh, okay, so this is the, like the full set of, res uh, of results. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, you have to have very good eyes to look into that so that uh, don't, but believe what I said. I mean, I, I kind of flag, uh, you know, the more important, uh, uh, important results in both jurisdictions, rich lead lag structures, but manufacturing move first and then services and therefore core, oh, but uh, you know, these persistence effects are much more, um, are much more uh, you know, relevant in the Euro area. Now, floor is to, Vero to Veronica that will take this fact and say, how can we write a model that takes in consideration, you know, that kind of take account of this fact and explain what's going on. Veronica, I think I have to move your slides. So I'll probably... Okay. Can I, can I share my slides? So they're the same? It's so, easier, no, maybe? No, no, the, 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 the they... slides are here. So you, you, you just tell us when you want to uh, move to, to the next I mean, slide? Uh, Vladimir told me that I have to move the slides. But, okay. uh, but no, if you can, it's even it's better. But now the slides are... Okay. Different. Now I don't see the slides. No. Can you share them? Is it the same then share, then try to I can share. Oh, yeah, perfect. Share. Okay, yeah. then it should be. Okay. Here you go. Thank you very much, uh, Lucrezia. And we we'll, uh, end with uh, Veronica. The floor is yours. Yes. Thank you so much. Sorry I cannot be there in person, but I'm happy I was able to be here anyway. So, as a, um, I want to, as Lucrezia has uh, anticipated, what I'm going to do now is gonna, I'm going to present the model. Uh, to look through these facts and try to rationalize them and, and try to draw some conclusions about uh, uh, monetary policy. Um, so first, let me summarize uh, the four key facts that I'm gonna um, that I'm gonna use and try to rationalize through the lens of the model. Uh, 
The first two are the ones that Lucrezia just showed you with the VR analysis. One is that uh, a response uh, to oil price shock uh, generates much more heterogeneity in inflation across sectors uh, than uh, in the response to a demand shock, or uh, in particular a monetary, po monetary policy shocks that uh, uh, Lucrezia has shown. The second important fact that Lucrezia has emphasized uh, is that uh, the European response to oil shock is uh, uh, less pronounced and but more delayed and more persistent relative to the US. And then I want to go back to two of the descriptive evidence facts that Silvana has shown at the beginning um, that emphasizes are two difference between uh, Europe and the US that the model is going to try to rationalize. One is that uh, the terms of trade patterns are very different, and in particular, the terms of trade that they that are related in Europe and in the improved in the US. And the second is that the private demand, in particular households consumption, but also investment, uh, has recovered in Europe uh, much more slowly than in the US. So now uh, we need uh, um, to think about these facts altogether. We need a model with multiple sectors, with oil and in open economy. And the, I'm gonna build a stylized model of this sort and the main mechanism that we are gonna emphasize is that in response to an uneven supply shock, so a shock, a supply shock that hits different sectors differently, there is a, a, a lagged response waves of sectoral inflations that are generated that make the response of aggregate inflation persistent. Okay, and so and the key to this persistency and this lag the uh, waves of inflation uh, is uh, the combination of two elements in the model and in the economy. One, this depends crucially on the input output structure of the economy, and second, uh, on the degree of price stickiness that emerge, as uh, Lucrezia has already uh, anticipated. So now the analysis, and in particular the VAR analysis that we have shown you. And I'm gonna, uh, the, the model I'm gonna use, I'm gonna, we, are, we have been talking about oil shocks, and in the model I'm gonna talk about oil shock. But as Silvana has shown at the beginning, there are uh, even broader sets of supply shock that we believe hit the economy that are also uneven, like supply chain disruptions, kind of. And uh, this model, I want to emphasize, uh, is going to talk more broadly about uneven supply shocks. So even though I'm going to talk about oil shocks, you want to keep in mind that uh, similar channels that uh, I'm going to emphasize here would go through if we think about the supply chain uh, shock or any other uneven shock that hits the supply. So uh, the model I'm going to present is a stylized New Keynesian model with two sectors and oil. Um, and building on my previous work with uh, Guido Lorenzoni, Ludwig Straub, and Ivan Werning. And the model is also related to previous work by Aoki, Woodford, and more recently Elisa Rubo. The important thing is that there are two sectors, and I'm going to think about them as services and manufacturing. And the, the crucial thing is that, as I mentioned, the input output structure is asymmetric. So manufacturing or sector B as inputs uses labor and oil directly. But services, so sector A, use labor, intermediate goods produced by sector B. So oil affect the production of good A or services only indirectly through the uh, um, impact on the intermediate goods. And we are gonna assume that there is price stickiness. So for simplicity here, we are gonna assume uh, uh, um, that firms uh, uh, set prices a la calvo. So in each sector, there is a fra different fraction of firms that can really optimize each period. And so for this simplicity here in the baseline model, we are gonna assume that wages are fully flexible. In the report, we also analyze the case where also wages are sticky. But the main mechanism goes through uh, even just with price rigidity, and so I'm gonna stick with that. So the main equation of the model that is important to understand the intuition behind the mechanism is the sectoral Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve uh, tells us that the inflation in sector S in each sector depends on past inflation because there is some inertia in the model. And here we take this inertia parameter rho uh, um, exogenously, but we can think of uh, microfounded with some form of indexation. It depends on future inflation because agents are forward-looking, 
And that crucially depends on the distance between marginal cost and the price in the sector. And uh, the way in which marginal cost, uh, the, the, the sensitivity to the marginal cost movements depends on the lambda parameters, which is a parameter of the degree of price stickiness in the sector. So marginal cost, you can see in the bottom line here, marginal cost in sector A depends on wages and the prices of sector B goods that are inter intermediate goods for sector A. But the marginal cost of sector B, which is manufacturing, depends on wages and the price of oil. So when there is a shock that hits the uh, price of oil, uh, this is going to have a direct effect on the marginal cost of sectors B, and so a first order round of effect on inflation in sector B, which of course is going to depend on the price thickness in that sector. So it's going to be not immediate but slow. It's gonna, the response of inflation is going to be even slower in sector A because there is a secondary effect, second round of effect, because now the marginal cost of sector B has to translate into changes in prices in sector B that then affect the marginal cost of sector A, and then depending on the degree of price stickiness in sector A are going to affect inflation there. So let me show you with a graph what happens. If we take a closed economy for now, and then I'm going to open it later, but some of the messages are going to go through with a closed economy. We take a closed economy where, the, where there is a fixed supply of oil, and we consider as a shock just a contraction in the oil supply uh, that generates a, a temporary increase in uh, the oil price. And we are going to assume, because the response of the economy depends also on monetary policy stance, we are going to assume that the background monetary policy is going to be such that employment is kept constant. So you want to focus on the blue lines are what happens when we have uh, this oil shock when the employment is kept constant. And what uh, uh, I want to emphasize is this uh, uh, panel here, the middle left panel, that show inflation and sectoral inflation. So what happens here? Uh, inflation, total inflation is the yellow one. Uh, we can see that as uh, in the VAR analysis, total inflation uh, goes up uh, uh, on impact a, a little bit, but then more with a hump later and some persistence. But this reflects a, a, a lot of heterogeneity in the two sectors. So sector A has a much uh, sharper response in inflation on impact, uh, and then it slowly uh, um, uh, moves away, but sector, uh, and you see this in the red red line, this is manufacturing, but sector A, which is services, is going to have much smaller response on, on impact, uh, because it's going to take some time before the increase in price in, uh, in uh, manufacturing are going to reflect in increasing prices in services, but then uh, it's going to kick in a little bit later and with a harm. So it's going to be a second wave of rising prices. And these staggered waves of inflation in the two sectors translate into a persistent response of aggregate inflation. Okay, and this is consistent, uh, this is the main fact, consistent with the stylized fact that uh, with a sectoral, uh, with an oil shock uh, or an uneven supply shock, uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity across sectors in response of inflation across sectors. And the second uh, fact, that, and in particular, I want to show that this depends on the degree of price stickiness. So if we consider two economies, one with more the de higher degree of price stickiness, and we are going to interpret that as a euro area because, uh, as Lucrez has emphasized, the, there is evidence that the euro area experience a larger degree of price stickiness, and you're going to call the U.S. the economy that has a, a, a lower level of a, a price stickiness, you can see that the two response of the economy are similar, but if you focus again on the panel on inflation, you can see that when prices are more sticky, the response is a little bit slower. It's, it's going to be less harsh on impact, but, it, but it's going to be more persistent because the waves are going to happen with some delay. And this kind of rationalizes what we see in the VAR analysis that compares U.S. versus Euro area. Now, of course, when we talk about differences between uh, the Euro area and the U.S., of course, there are other differences that are outside this model. 
the shock is not exactly the same, fiscal policy stance was different. Uh, here, I'm gonna just emphasize this, uh, how much, how far we can go with generating differences in the response of Euro area and the US uh, if the shock was the same, just because of some fundamental characteristics of the country. And I think that already this gives us some mileage towards uh, reconciling these patterns. Uh, now, the uh, uh, other fact that uh, uh, analysis that uh, uh, Lucrezia sh has shown us uh, is the difference between the response of an economy to an uneven shock, like an oil shock, and to an uh, even shock, like a monetary policy shock. And this model uh, is able to rationalize that and uh, re uh, reconcile, be reconciled with that, with the fact that, as you see again, focusing on the inflation panel, here we are choosing a monetary policy shock of a size, uh, so in to increase aggregate consumption so that uh, inf aggregate inflation on impact increases by the same amount than in response to the oil shock to make the two shocks comparable. But then what we see is that there is much less heterogeneity in sectoral inflation in response to a monetary policy shock than in response to an oil shock. And this is natural because in the model here, this shock is going to generate more demand in all sectors in an even way. So they're going to all respond. Okay? So there is going to be still a little bit of heterogeneity because the oil price is going to increase and this is going to generate the same mechanism that... Uh, uh, we have seen uh, uh, for the oil shock, but it's much smaller scale, so the heterogeneity is much smaller. Okay, now, so we see that the response to an oil, uneven shock like oil shock is different than the response to an even shock. So should monetary policy behave differently when the main shock that uh, hit the economy is an uneven shock relatively to an even shock? This is the big question here. So to kind of give some, uh, uh, move a little forward in uh, addressing this question, we are going to compare two scenarios. One where we keep, where the monetary policy stands keep employment constant, as we have, I've shown you so far. And another one where the monetary policy is a bit tighter and try actually to replicate the flexible price counterpart of employment. And here it is. So on the left, we have the loose monetary policy uh, it's still where, where we keep employment constant. On the right side, we have a more tighter monetary policy that replicates the um, employment uh, level of flexible price economy. And what is that we learn from here? There is a trade-off. Of course, the tighter monetary policy is actually able to generate roughly zero inflation, so reduces aggregate inflation, but even almost to zero. So in this model, there is almost divine coincidence natural level of employment, zero inflation. However, still, this is not uh, a, a one-way or an un, like a, uh, a clear-cut decision because uh, there are other effects that in the economy that affect uh, the efficiency of the economy that comes from the relative price adjustment. So if you look at this middle right panel, uh, this is the relative price of good B in the economy relative to good A. Now, wh when you look, compare the two economy, you see that when the monetary policy is tighter, the relative price adjustment is smaller, is much smaller than what would be the relative price adjustment in a flexible price counterpart economy. And uh, why this is a problem? Well, because uh, if prices are going to increase more in sectoral inflation, increase more in B because uh, oil price shocks are higher there, you would like to reallocate labor from sector B to like, sector A efficiently. But if uh, relative price don't increase enough in B, you're not going to have this efficient reallocation of inputs in the economy. Now, if you look at this graph that are lo log linearizations of the model, you would say, well, well, that's true, but not too bad because consumption actually goes down exactly as the natural uh, uh, flexible uh, price counterpart. So it's not too bad. But the truth is that this uh, distortion in relative price adjustment have indeed uh, an effect on welfare and on consumption. It's just that we don't see that here because they are second order effect uh, that though are sizable. And so what we did is like kind of a show what's the welfare loss in the, li in the full model, uh, non-linear model, uh, due to this uh, relative price adjustment. Uh, 
And we can see that we obtain actually a drop in welfare almost of one percentage point, which is quite sizable. So the message here is that, uh, sure, if we do tighter monetary policy in response to a supply shock, we are going to have lower inflation, and that's good. Uh, but be careful. We want to be cautious because uh, this goes at the cost of having less rapid price movement. And this can be costly for the economy for the efficient uh, allocation of resources. So when the shock of the economy is uh, uneven, we want to be a little bit extra cautious in being tight uh, because uh, a little bit of higher inflation may be actually necessary to generate, to allow for the some relative price movement uh, that are uh, uh, important for the efficient allocation of resources. Now, of course, uh, in the model, we don't have the cost of inflation, so we have to balance that with the anchor of inflation expectation and, and the other things in, in, uh, that are at, at, at hand. At, uh, Okay, so last Monica, thing, uh, we're gonna, could you go very fast on the open economy part? Yeah, because we need that's to it. So this is just uh, the uh, open economy. I'm showing you uh, in the open economy version of the model uh, where actually there is, a, so, like, if you think about Europe, Europe was importing oil more than producing domestically, while the, the, U, the U.S. was more producing domestically. Then you can see that actually... Uh, in, the, in Europe, uh, uh, this increase in foreign oil price is like an income negative shock, and so consumption actually dropped much more than in the, in the U.S., which is also another fact that reconciles uh, uh, with the stylized fact we have shown uh, at the beginning. I, I leave the word to Lucrezia for the concluding slide. Yeah, just let me say a few things to conclude. So you may uh, wonder why do you need a model in a policy panel? And uh, so I want to convince you that we need a model just to tell an alternative story for the story that uh, has been uh, you know, told uh, during this inflation episode in which really we were referring to uh, previous uh, and past uh, uh, episode of inflation. Now in a recent paper, for example, Bernanke and Blanchard taking uh, in a completely different approach than us, they conclude this has not been a story of the labor market. This is really the inflation story that we have seen in the last couple of years. It's all about the good market. So how do you write down a model? Or how do you tell a story about how uneven shocks propagate in, in the good market? And this is what you have just heard. And uh, uh, so, I mean, we go a step forward, forward because we show how propagation of uneven shocks in the good market can generate a persistent inflation, you know, if, uh, uh, and we do it through the lenses of the model and, and providing some empirics. Uh, uh, and, you know, there are things missing in this model, but, uh, you know, we capture the, the data, you know, surprisingly well with a very, very simple stylized model which has a little bit of heterogeneity and price stickiness. Now, um, mm, our story explained a bunch of, of things, okay, the difference between the US and the Euro area, and also has a more normative implications about the patients, okay, which is the title of our report. And we basically have three arguments uh, which call for more caution on uh, monetary policy and the level of aggression on monetary policy response to the inflation. Well, the first one um, is that, uh, you know, although there is a discussion about uh, the importance of demand and supply shocks, uh, a big part of the story, in particular in the euro area, has been uh, a big supply shock, so supply chains, and then uh, the oil shock uh, related to the Ukraine war. Oh, inflation may be the symptom of some relative price adjustment, uh, uh, which uh, uh, and uh, which you know they uh, and relative price have to adjust for efficient reallocation. So if you uh, if you kill inflation too fast, uh, this reallocation you kill this reallocation, and so there is a question of what are the costs in terms of efficiency, and of course, uh, you know this is also an empirical question of to what extent this is really first order or not. Um, then uh, the other argument to which are more qualitative, which are in the report, uh, is that, uh, you know, what is the risk of tightening too much? Okay, so there is this reallocation efficiency story, but also there might be the fact that, uh, you know, we haven't seen it yet, and that, uh, you know, the effect of monetary policy will be felt with a lag, and in fact, they have been felt, especially in the euro area. 
especially if considering that the origin of the euro area has also been a negative terms of trade shock, as Silvana has shown huge terms of trade shock. So that component of negative demand has also been uh, very important uh, and in a situation in which uh, in the euro area fiscal policy has not been so supportive uh, so that uh, the, the, the pattern of the demand uh, shocks on the economy in the two jurisdictions has been quite different. So I will stop here and, uh, you know. Thank you, Rupletia. Thank you uh, to all, uh, all four of you. So we have the stylized facts. We have the, the econometric estimation with uh, showing the inertia uh, of the euro area inflation rate and then the final model illustrating very well the trade-off between uh, uh, overall inflation and uh, relative price adjustment. Uh, so I'm sure that in the audience there are many questions, uh, so we are going to take a, maybe a first round of questions and, and then we'll take a second one. Catherine. Yeah, thank you for the presentation and for the report. I think um, it covers a lot of the narratives that also have been in the policy discussion. I would like to add another um, layer. So you are doing this in the terms of uh, oil and the domestic economy. I think there is also a layer in terms of uh, manufacturing and services. So when you look at the domestic economy, manufacturing has been affected much more quickly through the oil price shock, services less. You could also argue that manufacturing is more responsive to monetary policy and services less. So I think um, your uh, model is capturing a lot of the elements that, that have been also in the policy discussion, but I think you could even add more differentiation in, in your, in your uh, different sectors. So thanks a lot for the presentation. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so do we have a, yeah, please. Hi, uh, Martin Sandry from the Financial Times. Uh, congratulations, uh, you were right, others were wrong. Um, just, just one quick comment, and then the question. Um, your use of the word patience, I think, risk being overtaken by events. Uh, patience used to mean don't tighten so fast. Now that we're at the peak, patience increasingly, in the policy debate at least, means high for long, which is not, I don't think, uh, what you want to suggest. Uh, the question, a very short one and a short one. Uh, the very short one is, should this make us reconsider the conventional story about the 1970s as well? The short question is, that was a very short one, the short question is, you clearly want to argue that the standard story leads to policy mistakes, monetary policy mistakes. But when you say why, how your story would lead to somewhat different monetary policy choices, you basically rely on this allocation and efficiency outcome. But certainly in policy, and to some extent in theory, that doesn't appear anywhere, right? The sort of standard objective functions are, well, if it's not only inflation, it's inflation and aggregate employment. And it's not clear that your model produces an inferior outcome there. So is an implication here that you would want to talk about what, how we should think in a more sophisticated way about the objective function of monetary policy? Thank you, Martin. Um, maybe a third one? Yes, uh, Hervé. Hervé Le Bihan from Banque de France. There is a theme in the, in the report. Actually, I had the occasion of discussing this uh, in another seminar uh, with Lucretia, but if I may uh, uh, re-ask uh, again. So um, there is a theme that uh, inflation helps uh, relative price adjustment, which I, I think is, is um, probably um, not a, a general result. I, I think what you have in, in your model is you want good price to increase more than services price, given the shock to oil. But actually, so when in this context, you fight inflation by increasing rates, you are going to be more disinflationary for goods than services, then you compress the price, which is not the result you want. This is why uh, you, 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 you want in, in a more dovish uh, policy. But this hinge on the fact that services price in your model are stickier than manufacturing, which is a, a, an, an actual status fact. But my, my question, my wonder is, is this a general result? Because if you had another kind of supply shock, for instance, a wage shocks, it may not be the case that more inflation would, would be a, helpful to, to solve the situation. And if I may, um, 
had another question. Is it about the use of the Calvo model in the in the more theoretical part? So, uh, 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 as you know, there is evidence that given the large shock, um, companies may uh, turn into a more state-dependent pricing uh, uh, setup than time-dependent. Um, I'm thinking of the LIP paper at Sintra, for instance. Uh, large shock travel faster. So, so maybe facing such huge shock to to cost. Uh, you would want to use a, a state dependent model rather than a Calvo one. Thank you. Thank you. So you have uh, three uh, groups of questions. Uh, so, uh, Veronica, if you want to answer something, you just raise your hand. That's why we'll see it immediately. Uh, as maybe you want to start because it's uh, uh, a lot about uh, relative prices between services and manufacturing and uh, type of shock. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna give a first uh, uh, look at the question and then my co-author can, uh, can uh, jump in. So um, let me start from the last and then go back. So uh, from the last, uh, um, if it's a general, uh, so it's true that the mechanism you described is, is exactly the heart of the model. So the fact that we won't allow for a bit more inflation uh, uh, because uh, uh, this is going to allow for a relative price movement that are important for the efficient allocation of resources is what comes out from our model. Is it more general than, than uh, the, our model? Um, I think uh, so. Uh, in general, when there is, uh, uh, I mean, I have another paper, the paper I cited with uh, 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 for the Jackson Hole paper with uh, Lorenzoni, Werning, and Straub. But in, uh, in that paper, we also have a similar result in a different context. There we have labor reallocation because labor is, uh, 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 is moving from one sector to another. So, but as long as you have, um, it's more costly to have uh, relative price adjustment uh, with a reduction of inflation because maybe you have frictions in the economy and prices are more downward rigid than upward rigid. Uh, if you need to have uh, relative price adjustment, uh, you, you have to allow for a little bit more of inflation. So this is another channel. So it, I think is a broader, is a broader message. Um, the other point uh, is uh, uh, how about uh, um, uh, the anchoring in the in the 70s? Uh, I mean, I, my my view is that uh, that was also a big uneven shock. But there, it was clear that inflation expectations were completely de anchored, and that's the benefit of today is that we have uh, built a reputation as monetary policy authority. Uh, that allowed us uh, to do uh, mon policy that are more beneficial for the economy because uh, inflation expectations are more anchored. Should we think about a different type of uh, monetary policy objective? Now, in the model, technically speaking, employment was driven by the, the uh, monetary policy, but actually uh, it, you could uh, rephrase the model, or re reinterpret the model to have uh, the monetary policy that... Uh, that that uh, um, determine the level of consumption and employment is endogenous. Uh, so if you want, you can, I mean, the, having it in efficient allocation of resources is going to have an impact on the real economy and it can have an impact on unemployment. And so it's something that if you consider a model with a fully fledged nonlinear model with sectoral differences, uh, you would actually, uh, even looking at the simple employment aggregate level, you should uh, consider being more dovish. Um, now, maybe, though, like we have to keep in mind, uh, uh, because it's difficult to have nonlinear model of this type, uh, it would be easier that uh, to take into consideration a larger, broader set of objectives to keep in mind when we make monetary policy decisions. And for sure, it would be interesting to introduce more differentiation and more in richer input output structure in the in the in the model and. That's something that we can think about for the future. Thank you, Veronica. Lukacha? Yeah, I mean, I want to reinforce the second point because I think it's very important. Uh, uh, so I think it's true, okay, that uh, the objective uh, of central banks is aggregate inflation, so why should they care about this heterogeneity? But actually, you know, you, you can reformulate it that uh, if they have a secondary objective or even if they don't have a, a second objective or a secondary objective, they should think at the, in, at the cost uh, of reaching the secondary objective. And so I think if you want to push it a bit outside the model, I would say that this uh, would suggest that whenever you have an event shocks, and this we have 
thinking of oil here, but you can think of climate or anything, so, you know, these kind of shocks, you should have uh, maybe a longer horizon for reaching uh, your inflation targeting. So it's, it's a reformulation of the flexible inflation targeting in relation, you know, to the point that, you know, there is this secondary objective which has to do, well, for us is the welfare loss, but it could be reformulated in terms of consumption. Now, in the 70s, was it the same stories? I mean, we have looked a little bit into that, uh, and the 70s is much more complicated because there have been a very aggressive uh, demand policies before Volcker got in. G uh, Volcker got in uh, quite late in the process where inflation expectations were already going up and inflation had been creeping up for quite a while. So I think that uh, it was a quite a different uh, contest and uh, you could argue that uh, actually the second disinflation uh, episode uh, with, with Volcker was really, you know, facing demand rather than supply. I mean, okay, so the, the you, we can discuss that. But uh, I mean, for us, I think it's very important. We, and this is a, uh, to, 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 you know, this, this time it was different, okay? So <laughs> this time was, so we don't have to say always the same stories. So say, okay. The good thing as an academic is that there is a new episode, so maybe we're learning something here, which maybe is not the same as in the 70s. And if you look at uh, you know, infl inflation expectations, how they crept up before the tightening, you know, it's quite a different story. And this is also showed by Michaela in, in that chart, you know, at least uh, that looked at the anchoring part. Now, on, uh, on state-dependent prices, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that that, uh, you know, would complicate the model a lot. I mean, this is a very, you know, the model that just, you know, to, to, to give you an intuition. So we have used Calvo price rather than state dependence, but maybe in, in the future. Um, what else? Uh, Catherine, uh, yes. I mean, uh, if you see, you, we have manufacturing and services m moving in different directions. That's, the, you know, that's compatible probably with what you, you have done uh, internally at the ACB. Uh, for us, uh, this heterogeneity is telling us something, and that's what, uh, so that's why we, we were pushing that story. Uh, I think we have covered up. Covered up. Except that Silvana wants it. Well, to they covered it. everything. But, uh, so le let me say just a couple of uh, uh, words. Uh, patience, we were advocating for patience back in the spring, obviously, patients got lost, <laughs> and, uh, so that's, that's past, and, uh, and that's why, I mean, we think at this stage where we are with inflation at 2.9% uh, in the last reading, expected to have been 2.4% in November for the euro area, I mean, that's, that's a very different uh, <coughs> Um, scenario that where we were back in back in the spring. Obviously now the the call is for you know reconsidering the high for longer. Um, <coughs> um, so I and I think the idea of the model and how it maps into the real world. You have to think about the model as capturing trade-offs. Okay, and you know in the simple canonical uh, um, New Keynesian model you know, price dispersion is bad, and that's, that's why you want to uh, uh, squash it and have inflation, you know, price stability, inflation equal to zero. Here is capturing the idea that actually some inflation might be beneficial because it allows uh, this sectoral reallocation by allowing uh, for uh, price adjustments that are efficient. Uh, but, you know, you can reformulate the model and think about, you know, in different terms and how it maps, as Veronica was saying, in terms of um, unemployment or consumption. And, and that's the trade-off that is being captured here. The more you push on uh, one direction, the more you lose on, on uh, the other. Um, and yes, Lucrecia was saying the seven, there were many differences with the 70s. I mean, another difference is that now we have a very clear um, um, framework to think about monetary policy, a clear target. Even, even uh, in Volcker's times, there was no clear uh, inflation target, and they were um, okay with this 3.5% inflation, and what they had in mind was mostly actually uh, thinking about long-term interest rates. They wanted to uh, bring them uh, down. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, there is a case to reconsider in, in some sense if, if you want this transmission of uh, through input-output linkages, but obviously there was a much bigger demand component vis-a-vis -vis what we've seen in, in, in the Euro area. Nicola, you would like to add something? So, 
No, I, I just, uh, you know, when I think about the, the current market debate today, there is a lot of debate on the question of whether we're going to be entering a, a more volatile world in terms of the economic cycles. Uh, we talk a lot about the issues related to climate change, uh, geopolitical risks. We talk a lot about more fragmentation in global trade, uh, all of these elements. And, and I think um, this work becomes really important. I remember a, a speech that Yellen, Yellen gave where she talked about how the demand side is important for the supply side of the economy and the idea that if you keep constraining the demand side, then you end up destroying the supply side, which just seems intuitively very logical. And I think when we, when we look at a world where we do have the risk of having perhaps more frequent temporary supply shocks, I think thinking about how monetary policy should respond to that is really important. And um, this idea that maybe allowing a little bit more of relative price adjustment is part of the efficiency equation, I, I think is super important because just thinking about Yellen's speech, I become quite frightened if I think about quite a powerful reaction to each temporary supply shock because you can end up having a, a destruction of demand and then a destruction of supply and you can see quite a negative spiral emerging from that. So, so I think this work is also very relevant uh, to those bigger debates on how we're seeing uh, structural changes in our economy and, and how we can also adapt perhaps to shorter and more volatile economic cycles here. Thank you. So <coughs> I, uh, we are going to uh, take uh, just uh, perhaps the last question uh, yeah, to you. Yeah because I think we, we are going to the, the end. Quick question. Um, if there was a credible 4% inflation target, would that give a, the sort of room you're talking about, or is that a different dimension entirely? With the mic, because uh, Veronica will not. Uh, yeah. Well, you could say either a uh, higher, uh, higher inflation target or uh, simply a, a longer horizon for, for reaching the 2%, which was the original uh, justification for flexible inflation targeting. I think this, I mean, this way of thinking, you know, it advocates implicitly for, an, for, for in which the horizon actually depends uh, on uh, how costly it is to reach the secondary objective, the, the first ob ob objective. And an alternative is to embrace the flexibility in the remits embedded in central banks. I mean, most of them contemplate cases of, uh, uh, you know, large supply shocks that generate trade-offs. And in those instances, you can be clear about, you know, that temporary overshoot, but you're always converging back to your 2% target. So just embracing that flexibility both ways um, without <coughs> necessarily changing your target. Yes, providing the, the long-term uh, target is uh, still there uh, in the expectations. So yeah, yeah, to, of course, of course but, uh, no, so yeah, you have to be uh, firm, uh, firm on the <laughs> target uh, so that expectations remain anchor, but, uh, you know, that... Uh, this is the point. You don't yeah, have the, the counterfactual. Yes, uh, what would have happened as sh shouldn't a central bank have uh, uh, raised interest rates so fast? What would, would the, uh, the you, you showed uh, very convincing figures about the anchoring of uh, inflation expectations, but you don't, didn't see the counterfactual. No, okay, because, uh, um, but we are just uh, saying an alternative story, but if you think uh, okay, it is perfectly possible that inflation did not go up uh, more because uh, central bankers was very good, were very good. But on the other hand, inflation started going down before they started loosening. So that there is something uh, there which is quite independent uh, from... Uh, so this discussion is, is yeah. not qualitatively. I think we wouldn't disagree that yeah, some, yeah. some uh, tightening was needed. It's a, it's a bit quantitative how far you can go or you want to go with the tightening. Uh, we haven't seen secondary run, uh, you know, okay, second okay. round effect. Maybe you haven't seen it because monetary policy has been tight. But, um, you know, we haven't seen anything in the labor market. Uh, so this is the good market. Uh, so, you know. Still yeah. wages are increasing. So, uh -huh. yeah. But as you said, uh, the, it's, it's just a catch up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, one second. Yeah. With the, with the mic. Now, one thing, uh, just as an observation, uh, one thing that strikes me is I go to a lot of conferences, like all of us do, 
And what I find super interesting today is nobody contemplates the idea that we could go back to this kind of low inflation trap we were in just a few years ago. Now it seems like it's 100% sure we're in this higher inflation world and this is where we are. But I'm not sure that's true. And we can have a big argument about this and everything, but I think uh, what, what really is important here is, is that we try and, and think about new ways, and that's really what we wanted to do with the report here. But I think this idea that this is it, we're in the higher inflation world, and maybe just being a, one of the bankers in the room, when I look at what's happening in terms of the bank credit conditions, and we see it in the ECB bank lending surveys, and we see some of the evidence coming in, I would suggest that there is a lot of tightening already in the pipeline. We see it very clearly. And um, I hope we're not going to study a, a bad counterfactual here to, to our views. Thank you for this very positive uh, note. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I must say, uh, um, at least uh, you bring some uh, new ideas, a new way of uh, thinking about these uh, uh, events, and uh, I think this is really vi valuable, uh, very valuable. I suggest that we uh, continue the conversation uh, around uh, a glass. Unfortunately, Ver Veronica, we cannot be part of it, but uh, we wish you a, a very good day. Uh, and, uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, so thanks for being with us uh, today. And I think the cocktail will take place downstairs, um, so you are all welcome. Thank you.